This is Grady Manili presenting the 2018 Clinical Practice Guidelines for Diabetes in Older People. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this work, Eileen Nip, David Miller, Diana Sherifali, Daniel Tessier, and Afshan Zahidi. The key changes are outlined below. There will be new information on screening with fasting plasma glucose and A1C and the role of deprescribing medications in older people with diabetes. This is the Diabetes in the Elderly Checklist. First, assess for level of functional dependency or frailty. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Second, individualized glycemic targets based on the above uh, A1C less than 8.5% for frail elderly, but if otherwise healthy, use the same targets as younger people. Avoid hypoglycemia and cognitive impairment as these patients tolerate it very badly. Select antihypoglycemic therapy carefully. Caution should be used with sulfonylurea zarthiazoldine diones. DP4 inhibitors should be used over sulfonylureas. Basal analogs instead of NPH or human 3070 should be used. And you should give regular diets instead of diabetic diets or nutritional formulas in nursing homes. Frailty is a widely used term associated with aging that denotes a multidimensional syndrome that gives rise to increased vulnerability. This figure shows a clinical frailty scale which has been developed by Ken Rockwood and his colleagues in Halifax. It's important to understand this scale because the frailty index will be used to determine how uh, our glycemic targets are set. In other words, as you'll see later, where a person falls on this scale will predicate the parameters that we use for controlling their blood sugar, blood pressure, and lipids. As noted above, the scale is from 1 to 9. In essence, people who are in the 4 to 5 category uh, are moderately frail and have uh, impairments in at least one of their instrumental activities of daily living which are cooking, cleaning, shopping, driving, paying the bills, etc. Patients from 6 to 8 are more severely frail, and these patients have impairments in their basic activities of daily living, uh, such as bathing, dressing, toileting, feeding, that sort of thing. Um, and patients who are rated a 9 are essentially terminally ill. The A1C targets that we're currently going to use are as follows. Less than 7% for most adults with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Less than 6.5% for adults with type 2 diabetes to reduce the risk of CKD and retinopathy if at low risk of hypoglycemia. 7.1 to 8% for functionally dependent individuals, those patients who have an impairment of more than one instrumental activity of daily living. 7.1 to 8.5% for patients with recurrent severe hypoglycemia and or hypoglycemic unawareness, limited life expectancy, and frail elderly and or those with significant dementia. We should avoid higher A1Cs to minimize the risk of symptomatic hyperglycemia and acute and chronic complications. And finally, at the end of life, A1C measurements are not recommended. We should avoid symptomatic hyperglycemia and any hypoglycemia. This slide shows you the glycemic targets in older patients with diabetes. If patients have a clinical frailty index of 1 to 3, in other words, they're functionally independent, the A1C target is less than 7%, the preprandial sugar target is 4 to 7, and postprandial 5 to 10. For functionally dependent patients, grade 4 to 5 on the Rockwood scale, patients with impairments of at least one instrumental activity of daily living, the A1C target is less than 8% unless there is a higher risk of hypoglycemia, in which case the target should be 7.1 to 8%, preprandial 5 to 8, postprandial less than 12. For frail patients or patients with moderately advanced dementia, these would be categories 6 to 8 on the Rockwood scale, patients who have impairments of their basic activities of daily living. The A1C target would be less than 8.5% if there's a low risk of hypoglycemia, and 7.1 to 8.5% if the risk of hypoglycemia is higher. Preprandial 
6 to 9 millimoles per liter postprandial less than 14. Finally, at the end of life, A1C measurement is not recommended. You should avoid symptomatic hyperglycemia or any hypoglycemia. This slide compares the guideline recommendations from Diabetes Canada, the American Diabetes Association, and the International Diabetes Federation. The glycemic targets are very similar, except for the fact that Diabetes Canada recommends a hemoglobin A1C target for functionally independent patients of less than 7%. The A1C target for the ADA and the IDF is less than 7.5%. The blood pressure targets are also somewhat different. Diabetes Canada recommends a systolic blood pressure target of less than 130 for patients who are functionally independent and with a life expectancy of greater than 10 years. For functionally dependent patients, uh, patients who have orthostasis or limited life expectancy, blood pressure targets are individualized and the lipid targets are very similar between the three groups. This slide shows the characteristics of the patients enrolled in the goal-oriented control of diabetes in the elderly program, a study which was recently conducted to gain contemporary insights into the status and management of diabetes in an older patient population in a primary care setting in Canada. The study involved 833 patients, 64 physicians, and 36 primary care clinics in Ontario. You can see from the slide that the hemoglobin A1C values, LDL cholesterol values, and blood pressure values in these patients were quite reasonable. There were several insights that were gained from this study. First, exercise and dietary plans were prescribed in a minority of the patients in this study. This suggests that we need to do better in terms of implementing appropriate lifestyle modifications in these patients. Less than 20% had assessments of cognitive function or frailty. Again, if we are going to use functional status and frailty scales as a way to assess glycemic and other risk factor parameters in these patients, we need to do a better job of assessing these patients so we can appropriately apply these criteria. Most patients were on multiple medications. In fact, 20% of the patients were on more than 10 drugs per day. Many patients treated with sulfonylureas insulin had a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7, and this was true even in patients with high complexity and multiple comorbidity. We conclude from this study that there are a subset of older patients with high complexity and frailty who are being overtreated for diabetes in a primary care setting in Canada, and we also concluded that we should consider using agents which are associated with a lower frequency of hypoglycemia in a patient population that is uh, suffering from complex comorbidity and high complexity. This slide illustrates why older people are more susceptible to hypoglycemia. During hypoglycemia, older people are almost completely unaware of the autonomic and neuroglycopenic warning symptoms of hypoglycemia. This is shown on this slide where middle-aged patients have clear symptom awareness for these symptoms during hypoglycemia, but the elderly do not. At the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, you start healthy behavior interventions, including nutritional therapy, weight management, physical activity, plus minus metformin. If the A1C is less than 1.5% above target, um, if not at glycemic target within three months, you start or increase metformin. If it's greater than 1.5% above target, you start metformin immediately and consider a second concurrent antihyperglycemic agent. If patients have clinical cardiovascular disease, you start an antihyperglycemic agent with demonstrated CV benefit, including infoglyphosin, liraglutide, and canagliflozin. If the answer is no, we'll move on to the next page. And uh, if not at glycemic target, the same thing will occur. If a patient has no clinical cardiovascular disease, you should add an additional antihyperglycemic agent best suited to the individual based on the following considerations. Avoidance of hypoglycemia, 
and or weight gain with adequate glycemic efficacy. The choice of agent would include a DP4 inhibitor, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, or an SGTL T2 inhibitor. Other considerations to think about include a reduction in GFR, the degree of hyperglycemia, other comorbidities, etc. If patients have renal impairment, a subsequent table will show how to adjust medications appropriately. The following slide shows various additional antihyperglycemic agents that can be used. I'd like to make a couple of editorial comments. First of all, SGLT2 inhibitors seem to be effective in older people, but the risk of dehydration, falls, and fractures appears to be increased. Therefore, patients who are started on these medications must be carefully selected. DP4 inhibitors have been used in thousands of elderly patients and have been found to be safe and effective. Caution should be exercised in regard to saxagliptin in heart failure. Insulin glargine, insulin degladec, and insulin detamir are associated with a lower frequency of hypoglycemic events than NPH or premixed insulins in this patient population. In general, thiazoldine dione should be avoided in the elderly because of an increased risk of fluid retention, osteoporosis, and fractures. This slide merely reproduces the previous slide. If a patient is not a glycemic target after the use of uh, one of the agents shown above, you should add another antihyperglycemic agent from a different class and or add or intensify insulin therapy. It's important to make timely adjustments to attain target A1C values within three to six months. This slide shows the adjustments that need to be made in regard to antihyperglycemic agents and renal function. The table is self-explanatory, but should be reviewed prior to beginning any antihyperglycemic agent in an older person. If you decide to use insulin, you need to be certain that the patient is capable of administering the insulin independently. One way to determine if a patient may have problems with insulin therapy is to perform a clock drawing test. If a patient cannot draw a clock correctly, they either won't be able to give the insulin independently or will need extra time to be taught to use the insulin so that they can deliver it effectively. Diabetes in long-term care. Undernutrition is a problem in people with diabetes living in long-term care. Regular diets may be used in long-term care instead of diabetic diets or diabetic nutritional formulas because the latter have not been shown to improve glycemic control. So the recommendations are as follows. First of all, in functionally independent older people with diabetes who have a life expectancy of greater than 10 years, they should be treated to achieve the same glycemic blood pressure and lipid targets as younger people with diabetes. Blood pressure targets should be individualized for older adults who are functionally dependent or have orthostasis or have a limited life expectancy. In older persons with diabetes and multiple comorbidities or frailty, strategies should be used to strictly prevent hypoglycemia, which include the choice of antihyperglycemic therapy and less stringent A1C targets. Antihyperglycemic agents that increase the risk of hypoglycemia or have other side effects should be discontinued in these people. A higher A1C target may be considered in older people with diabetes taking antihyperglycemic agents with a risk of hypoglycemia with any of the following. Functionally dependent patients, 7.1 to 8%. Frail and or dementia, 7.1 to 8.5% end of life A1C measurements not recommended, avoid symptomatic hyperglycemia and any hypoglycemia. The clock drawing test as indicated above may be used to predict which older individuals will have difficulty learning to inject insulin. Older people who are able should receive diabetes education with an emphasis on tailored care and psychological support. If not contraindicated, older people with type 2 diabetes should perform aerobic exercise and or resistance training to improve glycemic control as well as maintain functional status and reduce the risk of frailty.
In older people with type 2 diabetes, sulfonylurea should be used with caution because the risk of hypoglycemia increases substantially with age. DP4 inhibitors should be used over sulfonylurea as a second-line therapy to metformin because of a lower risk of hypoglycemia. In general, initial doses of sulfonylureas in the older person should be half of those used for younger people, and doses should be increased more slowly. Glycoside and glycoside MR and glimepiride should be used instead of gliburide as they are associated with a reduced frequency of hypoglycemic events. Finally, meglitinides may be used instead of gliburide to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia, particularly in individuals with irregular eating habits. In older people with type 2 diabetes, with no other complex comorbidities, but with clinical cardiovascular disease, and in whom glycemic targets are not achieved with existing antihyperglycemic medicine, who have a GFR greater than 30, an antihyperglycemic agent with demonstrated CV outcome benefit could be added to reduce the risk of major cardiovascular events. And this would include empagliflozin, liraglutide, and canagliflozin. Detamir, Glargin U100, and U300 and Degladec may be used instead of NPH or human 37 insulin to lower the frequency of hypoglycemic events. In older people, premixed insulins and prefilled insulin PRENs should be used to reduce dosing errors and to potentially improve glycemic control. In older long-term care residents, regular diets may be used instead of diabetic diets or nutritional formulas. Sliding scale reactive and correction supplemental insulin protocols should be avoided in elderly long-term care residents with diabetes to prevent worsening glycemic control and reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. The key messages from the chapter are as follows. First, diabetes in older people is distinct from diabetes in younger people and the approach to therapy should be different. This is especially true in those who have functional dependence, frailty, dementia, or who are at end of life. This chapter focuses on these individuals. Personalized strategies are needed to avoid overtreatment of the frail elderly. Second, in the older person with diabetes and multiple comorbidities or, or, and or frailty, strategies should be used to strictly prevent hypoglycemia, which include the choice of antihyperglycemic therapy and a less stringent A1C target. Sulfonylurea should be used with caution because the risk of hypoglycemia increases significantly with age. DPP-4 inhibitors should be used over sulfonylureas because of a lower risk of hypoglycemia. Finally, long-acting basal analogs are associated with a lower frequency of hypoglycemia than intermediate-acting or premixed insulin in this age group. The key messages for older people with diabetes are as follows. First, no two older people are alike and every older person with diabetes needs a customized diabetes care plan. What works for one individual may not be the best course of treatment for another. Some older people are healthy and can manage their diabetes on their own, while others may have one or more diabetes complications. Others may be frail, have memory loss, and or have several chronic diseases in addition to diabetes. Based on the factors mentioned above, your diabetes health care team will work with you and your caregivers to select target blood glucose and A1C levels, appropriate glucose-lowering medications, and a program for screening and management of diabetes-related complications. If you want to learn more about the guidelines, the various chapters and recommendations, please visit guidelines.diabetes.ca or you can download the app from the App Store or the Android app on Google Play. Finally, more information regarding the guidelines can be obtained at guidelines.diabetes.ca if you're a healthcare provider or diabetes.ca if you're a person with diabetes.